this uh, in this discussion? Um, I can certainly give a brief introduction and then hand it over to Aaron. Fantastic. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so as you know, um, it's been village policy for some time to do a green infrastructure review prior to any um, large capital improvement project. So um, Kapoor was tasked with this exercise. Um, the village board approved, I believe, that proposal a couple of months ago. Um, and, and that proposal that report was included in this evening's board packet. So you've had an opportunity to review that. Um, it, it highlighted, it looked at several um, potential options and for various reasons um, recommends really only two of those as being either practically feasible or economically feasible. Um, and Aaron Bubb, the design engineer for the um, Lake Drive State Highway 32 project um, is here to give a brief overview of those findings. And then um, either of us and Joel um, would certainly be able to answer any questions that you might have. Um, there's several, I see several members of the conservation committee are also on the call this evening. Um, they were specifically invited um, to listen, participate in this conversation um, as the board <coughs> reviews these options. So um, I would turn it over at this point to Aaron. Thanks, Leanne. And uh, before the meeting got started, it's good to hear you had a nice uh, uh, outdoor event with skating, uh, talking about sharpening the blades remind, reminded me of when I bought my kids skates. Um, it, I learned that you, you do need to sharpen them. They don't come sharpen. So uh, the, their first outing was a little rough. But uh, uh, yeah, it's, so um, to get going into the report here, Leanne just asked me to give a quick overview. Uh, so we identified a couple alternatives and looked at the feasibility of doing this as part of the Lake Drive project. Um, as Leanne stated in her memo, there is an existing combined sewer area out here. Uh, this would be on the south end of the project from Edgewood up to Shorewood Boulevard. And then north of Shorewood Boulevard up to Kensington, uh, there is an existing storm sewer area. Uh, it drains about 23 acres is the drainage basin. Uh, so that was the area that we focused on for the screen infrastructure study. Um, and then typically treatments for, you know, stormwater ob objectives would be water quality, uh, reducing the peak discharge rate or infiltration. So we focused on water quality and providing treatment prior to water being released to Lake Michigan. Uh, when you consider Lake Michigan, the size of that body of water, uh, reducing the peak discharge is not really feasible. Uh, so that really wasn't considered in the report. And then looking at infiltration, uh, there's not a lot of open area to infiltrate and a lot of the existing soils are clay, uh, which don't really allow the infiltration. So getting into some of the alternatives that were considered, uh, one option would be to reduce the total impervious area. Uh, that potentially could happen by reducing the overall roadway width by one to two feet on each side. Um, however, you know, WSDOT had previously stated that they were focused on maintaining the existing roadway width um, at 44 feet, uh, but we did want to mention that in our report. Um, really, the most practical and feasible alternative is catch basins with sumps uh, in that storm sewer area between Kensington and Edgewood. Uh, there's, there's 25 drainage structures, 18 of them already are catch basins, uh, but there are seven inlet structures out there. Uh, they also vary in size. There's some smaller structures out there that are only two by three. Uh, not all the structures are four foot diameter. So when you look at, at the catch basins, really um, the best option is going with a 48 inch catch basin. Uh, as you start getting larger in size, the delta in cost doesn't necessarily equal more removal or more efficiency with that structure. Um, there's also more cost and more impacts when you have a larger structure. Uh, another feasible alternative that we looked at was permeable pavement and specifically installing pavers in parking areas. Uh, this would be in conjunction with catch basins that have sumps. Uh, however, this is a really expensive option, uh, but it is listed as um, an, an option in the, in the report. 
another consideration would be uh, biofiltration basins and bioswales. Again, when you look at this, there's not a lot of open space. It's not like Wilson Drive where you have median areas. Um, the terrace areas are occupied with trees and underground utilities. Um, and again, typically these would be planted with native grasses that might not fit the character of a manicured terrace or grass area. So it might not, it might not look appropriate in the corridor. Um, moving on, we did review underground detention area. This is essentially an underground wet pond. And the option we looked at was installing a 300 foot long, uh, 84 inch diameter pipe. Uh, it would have a permanent pool of about four feet Again, um, you know, the costs don't necessarily reflect all the other um, impacts that would be associated with this. There's going to be utility relocations in the roadway, utility adjustments. Um, installing a seven foot deep uh, pipe underground is going to prevent sanitary laterals and water main from, con you know, connecting back and forth from the homes to their mains. Um, and then just building it and maintaining access to property owners and through traffic during construction would be a major challenge. Um, so we didn't really see that as being feasible. Looking at proprietary devices, um, really these require a lot of maintenance unless they're installed on a village wide basis. Um, it's a real challenge to maintain. Our, our report in section five did summarize um, our opinion of construction costs for each of the alternatives. Um, I think Leanne did a good job of summarizing this in her memo to the committee. Uh, so I'm not gonna get in too much depth on the costs. Um, we did look at potential funding mechanisms. So there's the Green Infrastructure Partnership Program that you might be familiar with, um, but because of the size of Lake Michigan, ultimately uh, this project would score low and have a, a low likelihood of being selected uh, for that program. Uh, there is the Green Solutions Program that's funded by MMSD. Uh, the village could choose to use their annual funding to fund uh, a part of this work. Uh, that's really a village call. Um, another option would be the Urban Nonpoint Source and Stormwater Management Grant Program. Uh, this is through the DNR. Um, however, the Milwaukee River would be the more targeted water body. Uh, which is not where this drainage basin is going to. Uh, and then there's also the fund for Lake Michigan, uh, which generally looks for innovative projects uh, with a lot of PR. So again, we saw a low uh, likelihood of um, receiving funding from that, um, that source. So that's just a real quick uh, overview. Um, I'll turn it back to Leanne and um, any questions that there might be. Okay, um, <clears throat> just as a point of reference, uh, the mem my memo included a table that um, illustrated uh, the cost per pound of total suspended solid reduction. Um, I know um, certain trustees who have been on the board for a longer period of time maybe than the two we have with us this evening would remember some discussions about past projects, particularly Wilson Drive, um, where the board spent some time discussing um, bang for the buck, so to speak. Um, and one of the measures that they ultimately decided on to, to frame this discussion was um, the cost per pound of total suspended solids removed. That sort of gave us some context, gave us a bread box. Um, so I attempted to use some of those calculations from previous projects and sort of just line them up with what we would be talking about um, and the projected estimates for this particular project. So um, really that's just to provide some context um, for people who are familiar with those discussions. And it gives you a little bit of an opportunity to say, okay, you know, this level of investment would provide a benefit comparable to you know, this project or that project. Um, so that's really the purpose of that particular table. Um, if there are, I'm, I'm happy to open it up to any questions. I don't have anything um, specific to address at this point. 
you know, I'll just go around um, the room if it's a, if it's appropriate. I'd start off with Trustee Bachhorst if if, uh, if you've got any questions or comments about uh, this particular project. Thank you, Trustee Ersing. Um, no, thank you, Aaron, for the presentation. I'm still kind of I've read this information and formulating <clears throat> if I have any questions, but um, really appreciate it. So I will see you in my time. Thank you. Um, Rebecca, would it be appropriate? You know, I'd love to, you know, we have Trustee Stokebrand on the on the, the meeting in the meeting here. So would it be appropriate if I just kind of go around the room as well as reach out to the conservation committee members to see what their thoughts are? You bet. Fantastic. Uh, Trustee Stokebrand, do you have any thoughts or questions for Leanne about this project? Um, I do, and maybe Aaron too. Uh, I I have questions about the permeable pavers. They always sound so good, but I wonder about Wisconsin winters, given what's happened with the bricks, you know, in the downtown business district. And um, I just wonder, so that would go all the way. And I'm a little confused by the, and maybe I just didn't read enough, um, the area. So we're talking about um, from Edgewood Kensington, right? Because that's the whole project is that's the roadway. And it goes, um, you said the, we wouldn't apply it. We wouldn't, it wouldn't work for us to go for certain funding because it doesn't go to the river. It goes to the lake. And if it goes to the lake, you're not as likely to get funding from certain sources. So I, I'm sorry, I didn't let you answer one question. Um, tell me about permeable, permeable pavers in Wisconsin in 2022. Or 20, it'll be 2025, right? 26? 26. Is the technology there so we really can let a snowplow going? How fast do they go, Leanne? 20 to 30 miles an hour? Sorry. Um, yep, yeah, in that range. Mm -hmm. So what are your thoughts on the permeable pavers here for this, this particular project? Is that addressed yeah, to me? That, that, that would be to you, Leanne. What, what would be okay. your opinion on that? Yep. Um, you know, I'm, I'm aware that they've been successful in applications in other communities. Um, I would not be being perfectly truthful with you if I did not tell you that I, I have some con, I have some concerns, I have some reservations. Um, we don't necessarily, we haven't necessarily had the best experience with pavers in the roadway. Um, to be fair, I think this particular product is different than what we used on Capitol Drive. Um, it would also not be in the driving lane, but in a parking lane. Um, you know, this would be a very similar product to what we've used in our alleys. And to this point that has um, performed well, I think, and I'll, I'll let Joel, um, you know, follow up this comment, but I, I think our largest concern um, is not necessarily about performance, but about the maintenance that's going to be required with um, this widespread application of pavers in a state highway corridor. Mm -hmm. that, that would really be my concern. Uh, Joel, do you want to speak on, on uh, the pavers? <clears throat> uh, sure. I didn't have too much to add other than, you know, I think, um, you know, like Leanne said, this um, type of paver is completely different than what we've, what we've installed back in 2010 on Capitol Drive in Oakland. Um, you know, we've been using them in the alleys the last few projects. Um, I think a lot of our hesitation is it's just, you know, unproven at this point for us. Um, I know there's other communities that are, you know, using that application successfully, you know, in their downtowns and those kind of things. Um, but like Leanne said, I think, um, you know, there is some concerns with, a, you know, a higher speed type of street. Um, as much as I would like to say that everybody goes 20 on Lake Drive, we all know better, right? So, um, you know, I, I do have some concerns with that, um, but, you know, maintenance itself is is always a thing. And, you know, I, I worry that we're using, you know, uh, permeable pavers in a lot of our projects these days for alleys to 
um, you know, crosswalks or whatever. Um, all of those things need to be maintained annually. Um, and sooner or later, we're going to get a lot of them. And, you know, I, I do have concerns about us keeping up with up with the maintenance and they don't work if you don't maintain them. So, um, you know, I think those are my big concerns with, um, you know, installing permeable pavers uh, up and down Lake Drive. Yeah. Could I ask a follow up? Yes, please. So um, because we don't know the pavement configuration yet, we don't know the design, we've asked to keep the design that's in place. But if they, if the state tells us we want to go with two dedicated bike lanes and parking on only one side of Lake Drive, you would lose, I'm wondering about this number, the permeable pavers. If we lose parking on one side of Lake Drive, I can't imagine you'd put pavers in a bike lane, would you? Have you, I don't know. Probably not. And so that number would change Kathy. a lot. Right. Yeah, Kathy, Kathy, I wouldn't recommend putting it in the bike lane. If if that was the case, it, it would only be on one side of the road. But our, our analysis did show it on both sides. It, it showed it in the middle of the parking lane, actually. It reserved some area for bikes uh, and was a five foot width and then had a two foot gutter area. Um, so, so yeah, I don't recommend putting it in a bike lane. So how much would that affect this price that I see permeable pavers, 340,000? Am I looking at the right place? Village? I think they're a little bit more than that, aren't they? Yeah, I think the number was 788 uh, or something like that. Or I, the total I, was 827, right? Maybe yeah. I'm, I'm looking at a total line now. So if you took out those on one side, of Lake Drive, if we lose parking on the west side, which we don't want, but I'm just saying we'll know more later this year, would that number drop to half? Would 827 be 427 or four? So, so you're you're right, Kathy. I gotta make sure I'm not muted here. Um, th so there's two things. One, our analysis again only looked at um, Shorewood Boulevard to um, Kensington. Um, so I, I don't know if that came through in the exhibit, but the number you're seeing is for uh, parking on both sides north of Shorewood Boulevard. Um, so, so if you know if you, for some reason, if there was not parking on both sides of the roadway, that number would be cut in half. But should you choose to continue it all the way to Edgewood, then then it would increase a little. Does that make sense? Can you know uh, you're on you're on mute, Kathy? Sorry. Thank you and apologies. I guess without knowing, uh, there's just still a lot of moving parts yet. Thank no, you. And you know, I'd love to follow up too with uh with my conversations. You know, and love to hear from um, the conservation committee about this. But with these with these papers, you know, I, I there makes me a little bit of, a little bit nervous with the amount of saturation um, in that area of the bluff. We've had recent issues and I think I'd be a little bit nervous um, with all of that rainwater kind of going into that bluff and and potentially uh, you know contributing to any sort of more you know any sort of damage to the rest of that bluff up and down shore. Uh, Aaron, have you looked at any kind of into that into that issue? Is that is that something you guys foresee as a potential issue with these papers? Well, it ultimately it depends on on where it's draining to. Um, in this case, you know, it would be within in the roadway. Um, it would be a, a similar roadway structure to what the DOT is proposing for pavement. Uh, and then there'd just be under drains under that section, which would drain it to the storm sewer. Um, so it would be similar to, um, I think, a, a, a traditional roadway drainage system to some extent. Um, but as far as the infiltration, that we considered that with the um, with the bioswale option when we put that in the report for Atwater Park, um, that likely um, isn't desirable for the very issues you listed with the bluff. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so uh, we have Josh as well as Linda on the in the meeting here from the Conservation Committee. Um, do you have any opinions on on the proposal here, uh, Josh or Linda? Uh, I'll be very quick because um, I've got to put a child to bed in a few minutes. But um, uh, and I mean I, I I like all these proposals. It like, seems like good analysis. Leanne, is it fair to say, and Joel, and maybe the engineer can pipe in. So the, the most cost effective of the interventions would be the catch basins, is that right? Yes. I'm just scrolling through the material. Yep, that's correct. Okay, you get a much, so in terms of your TSS per, uh, what did you say? The oh, TSS. Right. Yep, and the, the dollars per pound. Um, dollars per pound, yeah. yeah. Bang, Bang for, for your buck. Bang yeah. for your buck, yeah. Pavers in this basins. particular, yeah, on this particular project, pavers um, don't really aren't don't give you the greatest return on investment. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so I, I guess I think that would be the point to emphasize uh, when this is brought to the full board. Um, that you know, in terms of environmental benefit, you know, all of these are attractive, but um, I, I guess I'm persuaded that the the pavement solution isn't appropriate for this kind of project. Uh, or I, maybe appro not appropriate is too strong, but it's just not the most um, not the most expedient way of uh, of handling the space. Linda, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, sure. Um, yeah, and and we didn't have any opportunity to talk amongst ourselves in the conservation committee about this. You know, it came up very quickly. Um, I I wanted to be here to express my appreciation to the village of Shorewood for the green infrastructure work that has been done in our public works projects and uh, for having the study done um, on green infrastructure for the Lake Drive project. Um, so that that's that's the main thing um, that, that I wanted to express. Um, I, I am not, a clear on how how the whole process uh, went went forward, um, as I I had been reviewing the uh, the proposals from the transportation department uh, on the the roadway project. Didn't see anything about green infrastructure there, so I had raised the uh, request to have green infrastructure done. Um, if if that was already planned and in the works I, that wasn't communicated to me. So I don't know how that all came about, but um, I'm, I'm just glad that that it's been done and that we we have a proposal that um, I, I guess it wasn't mentioned in, in the presentation here. And, and I really only get, uh, I saw Leanne's memo uh, that explained the situation. I didn't see the whole report, but um, the uh, you know according to your memo the the catch basin with the forty eight inches uh, is at no cost to the village and you know I I can't see why there would be any any issues with having that go forward um, and uh, Aaron Bob I heard you say that that you characterize that as the best option I I know that. Um, there, there was consideration of a of a larger um, catch basin than the forty eight inches, and uh, I that would be at a cost to the village. Um, and you know maybe we should hear a little bit more about that. Um, and then you did clarify that the area we're looking at is from Shorewood Boulevard to Kensington, which is a pretty significant stretch. Um, and so I just want to know if you have anything more to say about the the option of the larger catch basin. Sure, Linda. Thanks. We um, we did look at a, a sixty inch diameter, and again, you know, there's as you go up in size, there's there's more cost, but the the change in cost isn't comparable to the the removal that you get. So eventually, that starts leveling off, and you're not 
gain, again, as Leanne said, as much bang for your buck as you get there with the bigger structure. So um, you also have the cost of, you know, more material to fit in a larger structure. You have more impacts. Um, there, it is a really tight uh, corridor with underground utilities. Uh, so now you have a potential impact where you're, you're moving all around a lot more things and there's a lot more added utility costs and impacts too. Uh, thank you, Aaron. You know, also thank you, Linda, for, for you know, being engaged and, and being conscious of the green infrastructure. Uh, one second, uh, Kathy, and then I'll, I'll get to you. But uh, you know, I, I think you know, since I've uh, been a part of the DPW, it's been a real focus of our, of our group here to always ask about green infrastructure. Uh, when this project came about, uh, it was a question that I had is, is there gonna be green infrastructure opportunities with this? And the answer was, well, um, WSDOT would not, would not fund, would not pay for any green infrastructure. So then I think it was just the, you know, what, well, since we're doing a project on this scale, what can be done? If, you know, is there something we can be done that can be done? Uh, we are right next to, you know, a large body of beautiful fresh water. And I think that's kind of our, you know, uh, we've got to put that on a pedestal here in Shorewood. So I think the opportunity is what, what can we do while we're doing this construction? And uh, these were the options that, that were presented to us. So um, I'm really excited. I actually went into this thinking uh, the 60 inch catch basin basins would be a good idea, but I, I've, you know, I've since changed my mind and, and uh, I think the 40 inch, 48 inch catch basins would be fantastic. Kathy, I'm sorry. Um, did you have a question? Yeah. So I'm just wondering, and I apologize if I missed it in the material. Are we taking into account quantity and the large rainstorms that we've had? that we're getting and that we're seeing, are we taking into account, you know, when, I mean, I know we're looking at cost, which is always good um, and the utilities. So what kind of a, like a hundred year rainfall is, how is this system, if we go with the four foot diameter catch basin, will the system handle that, it, you know, we think we're gonna see more of this. So we wanna build, so we have capacity. I guess that'd be a question for Aaron. So that, that's a great question. Uh, typically your, your DOT um, storm sewers are designed to accommodate a 10 year storm. Uh, and then you typically check the 25 year storm to make sure you don't have any surcharging at structures. Um, so as part of our analysis uh, with that project, uh, we are looking to see if there are any issues with the existing system. If they're not, um, the scope of that project is to keep the trunk line in place for those existing storm sewer systems. I guess I just wanna be clear, if we get a storm like we had in 2020, 2010, are we gonna have eight to 10 inches in our basements again? I mean, we'll have done our South our interceptor sewer thing, right? Yeah. It'll be done. Yeah. That there's no system that we could build um, that that would guarantee that that would not happen. Um, th there's no community in the country, probably on Earth, that could actually afford to build a system that would be able to convey the water, you know, up to eight inches in an hour. Um, we've been pretty clear and straightforward about that through all of our planning and design work for the Southeast Area Combined Sewer, and um, we're definitely mitigating basement backup risk but we can't build a system large enough to guarantee it will not happen. So if we would go with the five foot versus the four foot catch basin. Kathy, the, the size of the catch basin isn't necessarily um, a function of the size of the storm sewer pipe. Okay, We're so- We're talking about I, the amount I, of- I just wanted to, if I wanted to say, I want a little extra insurance for capacity for big weather events. What would be my best choice on this list that you've provided? We're, we're talking about apples and oranges. Okay. So help me separate the apples and the oranges. Is there anything here that has to deal with capacity? No. Not, not for flooding events, no. Okay. These are just catching the solids. So right. any, any of the solid materials, the TSS, any of, that, any of that, those solid materials will be caught in the catch basin. So, and I think the um, consultant here, Aaron is, is saying that 48 inches will be plenty to catch whatever materials are falling into that. 
but with the amount of water, I don't, it, it's not necessarily going to help any kind of drainage because if you look at, there's a, there's a graphic, Kathy, in the package, in the packet, and uh, you could see that pipe, the pipe flow and the level of the pipe flow. So the water gets up to that pipe flow and it's, it's going through the pipes and the pipes are still the same size, but the basin is just catching all those solids. And at this point, the streets are flooded anyway, so. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you know, with consideration here um, of the village meeting coming up in about eight minutes, um, I, I am personally with, if, if nobody else is, is, has any more questions or, or comments, I'd like to just make a motion. Uh, Trustee Bachhorst, is that, uh, is that all right? Do you have Perfect. Any? Okay. Yep. So I move the Public Works Committee recommend the green infrastructure best management practices in the form of 48 inch catch basins be included in the 2026 Lake Drive project with no direct cost impact to the village. I second that. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, and that's it. That's all we've got. So um, that will be our recommendation. Always love those words, no direct cost impact to the village as well as do something positive. So that is a win-win. Um, with that said, uh, Rebecca, is there is there any other, is there anything else we need to discuss here? Nothing else on public works. Um, so it's 7.23 and we're gonna be on the same Zoom for the regular meeting. So if you wanna pause and take a brief break, we'll be back here in a few minutes. Great, and uh, thank thanks, you, thanks again for including us. For, for being a part of the meeting and- uh, Yeah, thank you. From you. Thank you so much for all, all right. that. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Aaron, as well, for all your work too. And Leanne and Joel and everybody on, um, on, on Zoom. See you soon. Right, thank you. Thanks, Aaron. Thank you, Leanne. Members of the public, um, meeting is being recorded. Um, has this meeting been publicly noticed? Yes, it has. Great. Uh, could you call the roll, please? Trustee Orndorfer. Here. Trustee Backhorst. Present. Trustee Ersink. Present. Trustee Stokebrand. Here. Trustee Warren. Oh, here he comes. Let's see. He's joining now. Good evening, Trustee Warren. We just called the meeting to order and we're just calling roll. Good evening. I'll be on camera shortly. Just let me finish up dinner here. Okay. No problem. And uh, President McKay. Here. Um, and Trustee Moore Baldoff is excused this evening. Great. So now we're moving on to item four, special order of business, of which there is none. Um, item five, uh, the consent agenda. Is there a motion to approve the con consent agenda? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay, um, so there was a motion by Trustee Ersink, uh, seconded by Trustee Warren, and I see Trustee Stokebrand would like to speak. Uh, I'd like to please pull B as in Betty and E as in Evelyn. Thank you. Any other discussion? All right, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda um, with the exception of 5B and 5E? So moved. Second. All right, um, Trustee Ertzing and Trustee Warren, first and seconded. Um, all those in favor, any further discussion? All those in favor say aye or show of hands. Aye. 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 All right, looks like five zero. Um, and it looks like we lost Trustee Bachhorst. So make a note, 734 absent. Thank you. All right, moving on to item six, items removed from the consent agenda. Item 5B, consider meeting minutes from January 18th, 2022. Trustee Stokebrand. 
Thank you. I just wanted to um, make sure that we got in. Uh, it was, I think, page 55 of the packet, the motion about the lifeguards. I made a motion that had, there was elaboration about a cap of $10,000 on the liability insurance and the fact that we would pay the vendor and then she would pay her, the insurance company. And that was not reflected in the minutes. So I, it's on the it's on the recording. I went back and listened to, to it. So that needs to be a, amended to reflect, first of all, the cap of $10,000 for the liability insurance and that we would pay the vendor and then she would pay the insurance company. And I guess my question also is we do, was um, Ivy Lucere notified that we've capped the insurance? Um, Ivy was on the call that evening um, and listened to the discussion. So um, she was privy to the discussion. And um, if the vendor paying the insurance was about not, it wasn't necessarily noted within the motion, we'd be happy to add that. That is what we have done customarily. So it would be current practice. Okay, I was under the impression we could only change the minutes to something that actually was said in the meeting, but um, just so it's, you know, there's the cap and the payment method, it goes straight to the vendor and she pays for the insurance. And then there was just a typo, um, the next two graphs down, um, I moved to approve the RFP for EDI environmental scan for release in July of 2022, not 2002, typo. And that's all I had, thank you. Okay, motion to approve the minutes as uh, as corrected. I'll move. Second. Okay, motion by Trustee Stokery and seconded by Trustee Warren. Any discussion? All those in favor of approving the minutes as corrected? Aye. Aye. Okay, minutes approved 5-0. Moving on to 5E, consider Three Lions Pub application for Shorewood Shenanigans special event permit, short-term cabaret license, and extension of premise for Saturday, March 12, 2022. Um, Trustee Stokebrand. Thank you. I just wanted to clarify the start times and ending times were a little bit different on some of the pages of the document. And I think it's important for the residents who live in that area to have consistency. Um, so what's the best way to go about this? Um, I see, I think on one page, it was ending at nine. Um, another pay, place it was ending at eight. One place I saw streets closed at 10, another place streets closed at 11. As long as everybody knows and we're all on the same page, um, So that the residents in the area are getting clear information about when and you know when the music will stop and when their street is opened again is my question. On the application, they had listed from noon to nine. Um, so we'd be happy to clarify that with them. Yeah, I think let's see as I was looking on page 84. Let me zoom in a little bit. I think the thing that that was most concerning was the, the letter that went to the residents had a different, uh, got a computer issue here. Um, uh, it says the event will take place from noon to eight. Uh, that's about 84 of the packet. The streets will close at 10, reopened at nine. Um, but I think another place it said the street would close it. So um, I have no issues with this as long as all the times are consistent and the, the residents know when the street's closing and when the event will wrap up. If it, it's just a matter of cleaning up okay. the paperwork, but it's important to the people who live there. As I said, we'd be happy to clarify with the applicant to ensure that it's consistent. 
Okay, Trustee Ersink. I just wanted to know for the record that the um, the bid is no longer uh, hosting this event. This is now just purely hosted by Three Lions. Um, just if anybody is is you know, um, just for people to understand the uh, the application process and all of that that we are not uh, or the bid is not um, not applying for this. It would be Three Lions. Okay, so um, Trustee Sofrians, yes? I'll make a mo motion to approve Three Lions Pub application for Shorewood Shenanigans Special Event Permit, short-term cabaret license, and extension of premise for Saturday, March 12, 2022, uh, after the uh, opening and closing times are made consistent and communicated to residents as such. Second. Okay, motion by Trustee Stokebrand, um, seconded by Trustee Ersink. Um, Manager Ewald, is that, as far as how we worded the motion, is that um, clear and achievable? Yes. Um, by your standards? Okay. Then I can support that. Any further discussion? Hearing none, um, all those in favor, show of hands or voice. Aye. Aye. Looks like five um, in favor. Any opposed? Zero. Motion carries five zero. Thank you. Moving on to public hearings, of which there are none this evening. Um, and item eight, citizens to be heard. This item is for matters not on the agenda. Discussion may follow comment on non-agenda items or discussion and action may come at future meetings. Is there any um, citizen that would like to be heard this evening? All right, I am not seeing any hands or any microphones unmuted. So we'll move on to new business, item nine. So item 9A, considered shared sweeper agreement. Um, this is meeting number two, and I will hand it over to Director Bushlick. Thank you. Um, You'll recall that your November 11th meeting um, included discussion of allocation of ARPA funds. Um, and one of the initiatives that was introduced that evening was a plan to improve the efficiency of the village's uh, leaf collection program and process. Um, up to this point, so we'll say through the fall of 2021, um, we have used six to seven people um, daily for that process, three of whom typically have been temporary workers. Um, we have own and operate three um, vacuum sweepers, which are trailer mounted units, and they're attached to um, three of our dump trucks. Um, and so we have um, three machines operated by two people. Um, that that are deployed each day. Um, on the weeks where we have access to the um, shared sweeper that's jointly owned with Whitefish Bay, we have a seventh person that operates that machine and basically um, follows behind those crews kind of cleaning up after them. Um, the, the proposal that, that you approved that evening um, in, in revamped that operation. Um, we would still be using three pieces of equipment, um, but it would allow us to reduce the labor um, to three people. Um, and that would be two people operating truck mounted leaf vacuums um, and a third in a sweeper that would be entirely owned by the village of Shorewood and, um, and used each day during the leaf collection um, season. The, the sweeper that we currently own with the village of Whitefish Bay is a 2012 Timco unit. It is referred to as a vacuum or regenerative air sweeper. These types of sweepers are typically built specifically and purposely for stormwater improvement. Um, the type of sweeper that we proposed in the, um, in the program that we talked about in November 
was actually a vacuum, excuse me, a mechanical sweeper. Um, th those types of sweepers are kind of an older generation technology, if you will, and they are typically geared toward um, less toward the um, the collection of fines, suspended solids, sediment materials, and more toward the collection of, of larger, larger materials, such as maybe big leaf piles. Um, you know, uh, if there's a car accident, you run it through that intersection, it can pick up bits of glass, larger pieces of material, twigs, that sort of thing. Um, after your discussion in November, we continued to, to have some conversations with vendors and continued some research and, and came upon some, some additional information that um, gave us a, a higher level of comfort that in fact, the, the vacuum sweeper, which is the same type that we own with the village of Whitefish Bay, could in fact successfully operate um, during the type of leaf collection operation um, on a daily basis that we were really looking for. Um, so after um, we received that, that information, um, excuse me, um, in looking at the, the sweeper agreement that we have with the village of Whitefish Bay and kind of reviewing our capital improvement, or excuse me, our capital vehicle replacement plan. Um, we, we're back to you today to, to talk to you a bit about that, that plan that, that you adopted and, and some modifications that we actually think would really be beneficial to the village. And in particular, um, that would be rather than purchasing a mechanical sweeper and um, being owner of one and one half sweeper units, um, we think it really would be to the village's benefit financially and otherwise to purchase a, a vacuum sweeper um, that the village and the Department of Public Works would have access to um, 365 days a year, particularly every day during leaf collection season and then throughout the rest of the sweeping season. Um, and then um, either terminate or let the current agreement with the village of Whitefish Bay for ownership of that shared sweeper expire. Um, that sweeper, um, as I mentioned, is a 2012 unit. Um, while neither of our replacement plans actually indicate um, replacement is imminent, in fact, both villages have agreed, um, I should say both mechanics have agreed that um, there's not much life left in that unit. Um, and we would both be looking to replace that in budget year 2023. Um, so to continue with that agreement would really mean that we would be purchasing a sweeper um, two budget years in a row. Um, it would allow us access to two different types of sweepers. And as I mentioned, owning one and a half units, but we really think it, it'd be more economical and efficient for at this time with the money that had been allocated rather than purchasing that mechanical sweeper to go ahead and purchase a, a vacuum sweeper that would allow us to do the leaf collection program that we had initially introduced to you, but also would provide significant stormwater benefits that a, that a mechanical machine does not um, on every other day of the year. So, um, that is a nuance in certainly in the proposal that you approved in November. Um, and if you are if you are in agreement that that is in fact um, economically a better deal for the village, then um, then we would ask that you um, that we begin discussion about the termination of that shared agreement with the village of Whitefish Bay. Um, our most recent agreement, a copy of which is in your packet, does address steps. Um, that the village would take to, to begin um, the termination of that agreement. So your agenda this evening includes language that would allow um, that would allow that action if, if you agree that um, that is something you'd wish to pursue. You're muted, Anne. Thank you. Is that better? You didn't hear me? Okay. 
Um, at this time, we can open it up for um, questions um, or a motion. And I think that what I'd like to do is um, maintain a focus on discussion and questions that will help you take action on the matter before us. I know that we're all very committed to looking for shared service um, opportunities, and this is a very um, so try to limit discussion so that we're not sort of going out of scope to a larger discussion of, of um, service sharing, but that we're focusing on this um, matter that's before us this evening. So, Trustee Ersink. Thank you, President McKay. You know, I, I personally feel like this is a really um, a great thing for Shorewood to, to own this particular piece of equipment. I think, uh, you know, uh, collecting these types of, you know, the TSS, the, the types of different waste we have in our streets is, is crucial for our community, um, especially the amount of trees that we have here. Um, so I, I do think this is a great idea. Um, we would love to know from a financial perspective, I'm sure everybody wants to know uh, the cost difference between what a mechanical sweeper would have been and what uh, this new vacuum, um, vacuum type sweeper is. And then also uh, how much we think we can get on the market for our uh, shared, our current shared sweeper. Um, I will do my best with that. Um, my understanding is that the, the cost difference between the two different types of unit is not significant. Um, and, and either could be purchased under the $350,000 that the board earmarked um, back in November. Um, I do believe we will be well, well under the 350. Um, however, you know, as we've talked about previously in this particular day and age, um, getting quotes on vehicles and equipment, you know, is, is it, it's a bit of a moving target. So I, we, we don't have anything as of yet um, specifically signed and in writing. So I don't, I'm, I'm not real comfortable giving you an exact amount because, you know, that, that may change by nine o'clock this evening. Um, but I, either unit can be comfortably purchased within the $350,000 that was approved previously. That, that was my that was my real question there. Um, also, you know, just to follow that up, uh, do you have a nice warm spot in the garage to to put this uh, the sweeper, or are you going to have to you're going to have to play Tetris back there to to get um, something? That... It's a it's a daily game of Tetris, but we you know we we store the sweeper when we have it, so um, you know something will lose its its warm covered spot, but. That, that's that's the reality of the deal. Okay, thank you, Liam. Trustee Arndorfer? Yeah, um, uh, thank you. I just wanted to follow up on what Arthur said, um, or Trustee Ersink said in a, in a way. Um, when we were last year talking about this uh, upgrade, uh, we were talking about savings of about $10,000, I believe. Is that like the same ballpark savings that we would expect with this change? I'm sure that that savings reference related to the hiring of the temporary help. Um, and Got it. again, okay. that, that, that doesn't change. That doesn't change. Right, correct. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Yep. Trustee Warren. And, uh, <clears throat> Leanne, I know this is mentioned on the, in the packet, but just to get it on the record, uh, so termination of this agreement you feel won't cost us um, won't cost us with the Whitefish Bay Department. That is, the relationship will remain. And I'm asking a leading question here. The relationship will remain strong, and um, it won't impinge upon kind of future uh, endeavors with that department. I certainly hope not. I mean, we have a long history of working very closely together, and and quite frankly, we probably do a lot more sort of outside of written agreements um, that we just do on a daily basis that, that maybe the board, our respective boards aren't even necessarily aware of. Um, you know, definitely the transfer station is huge and, and you are all aware of that agreement. Um, but, you know, we have a, a lot of more informal agreements where we help each other um, back and forth. I think one of the, one that I noted in the memo was um, when, when our, mechanic or their mechanic is on vacation, we sort of have an agreement that you know, if we have any type of catastrophic incident, um, you know, the other one would be willing to do what can be done. Um, 
we, we frequently will um, share equipment. Um, oftentimes, you know, if, if they have a garbage truck down um, and, and for whatever reason need, um, need some assistance. In the past, they've frequently used our fourth truck um, to run routes and do that. You know, and, and, you know, we just, that's what we do. We, we help each other out. So I, um, you know, I think this is a bit, this isn't something that we've been talking about for years and years. So I certainly understand their surprise, if you will. Um, you know, we didn't give them a ton of lead time to plan for this. And so, you know, I, I, I understand some, if, if there's frustration there, I certainly understand that point, but none of it was, was intentional. I'm, I'm, I'm confident we can continue the good working relationship that we have. And they do know, just to be clear, they do know that this is on the agenda for tonight. This isn't going to be completely out of the blue to them. They do know, yes. Okay. All right, further discussion or more questions or a motion? Trustee Um, I am prepared to support this. It is disappointing that we're leaving one of the few agreements we have to work with like an actual written agreement to work with another municipality and shared shared services is is the mantra for saving money but you know the federal government is dangling tens of thousands of dollars in front of us and so we can get a bright new shiny thing it will help us i'm really you know we have to do this for the environment i think and um i hope that we can you know i'd like to see the police study that they're doing about consolidating police departments on the North Shore, I'd like to see us lead an effort to look at consolidating DPWs on the North Shore, at least some functions. I think that we have to, in due diligence to the taxpayers, look at DPW consolidation in some way, shape, or form. But I'm willing to support this tonight. Um, we don't have a place to put it, really, but um, it seems like the right thing to do, so I'm ready to make a motion. Thank you. Uh, just. As a point of information, I did talk to Director Butchlick earlier today, and she said it would be appropriate to add uh, a cap on this. So I move that staff be directed to, to purchase a vacuum sweeper with previously authorized ARPA funding not to exceed $350,000, and that the street sweeper agreement with the Village of Whitefish Bay be terminated. Second. All right, motion by Trustee Stokebrand, seconded by Trustee Ersink. Any further discussion? Hearing none, uh, let's take a roll call vote, please. Trustee Ersink. Aye. Trustee Stokebrand. Aye. Trustee Warren. Aye. Trustee Arndorfer. Aye. President McCaig. Aye. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you very much. All right, moving on to 9B, considered elected official compensation. Um, so there's a memo in our packet from Director Emanuelson. Um, and the reason why it's coming before us is that this has been um, raised as part of the budget discussions in the past, um, but it's never been um, raised in a, you know, we've never had enough leeway time to actually um, discuss it and consider it. Um, so staff is bringing it forward just of their own volition because they've noted so to give the board the opportunity to give direction to staff so that they could prepare um, applicable documents and that the board could fully consider um, this initiative. So for this evening, all we're being asked for is direction. Um, I'll ask Director Emanuelson to um, just talk through the memo a bit. Um, and then I'll really look for um, lead from the board. If there's a majority of people that want to give direction in the affirmative this evening, um, then let's discuss it. If not, then let's move on. Uh, oh, and if there's a will to defer the item to a future meeting, since we have two board members missing at this point, um, I would entertain that as well. Um, but 
just to be clear that this is only for discussion for direction. Director Manuelson. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Um, this item has come up several times in the last uh, two and a half, three years. Um, you know, we've done surveys of the various communities back in 2020. You know, the memo notes that it's it's been since 1974 when the current stipends for elected officials were established and that perhaps uh, it was time to take a fresh look at that, um, make sure we uh, at least just address the timeliness of that issue and, 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 and maybe uh, put things in the, in the context of uh, 2020 or 2022, 2025, whatever the years may be. Uh, so we did bring this forward. Uh, to, I keep a, a, a small pile of things that are, are pending that I think need to come back and, and have a, a proper vetting. Uh, again, during the budget cycle is, is not the time uh, that the finance director likes to get into uh, policy matters, right? Uh, so this is before you. Um, uh, I outlined one uh, scenario that I I thought might be a, a good place to start discussion and really I'm seeking the board's input uh, to either move forward along these lines or along these lines with a, a, a variation or, or to put the matter to rest. So, I will leave the discussion on that to uh, to the board and uh, I'll be able to answer any questions should you have any. Thank you, Director Manuelson. Um, so this, at this time, I'd like to hear from the board whether there is a will to defer the item um, until all board members are present. Um, a, if there are any questions, and if we just need to do a straw poll to see if there's enough interest um, to have a discussion. Trustee Warren? Yeah, I, I, I was gonna say, I, I, we could just, I'll just start with, as opposed to launching into my thoughts on it, I'll start with, I would support a straw poll just to figure out whether, you know, if we're all aligned one way or another, it might either obviate the need for a discussion or lay the groundwork for discussion. All right. Um, can we do a show of hands to those that are interested in discussing this this evening that would consider supporting it? Trustee Sofrand. Okay. Um, those that are not interested in the matter moving forward. And then. Okay, so three not interested, one no, one neutral, not sure. Which is that? Can I just, um, I mean, I, I'm not particularly interested. I do wonder if Trustee Baldoff would want to have a, a say in it as one of the continuing board members who would, you know, be impacted by it. But I mean, otherwise, I'm, I'm happy to. That that would be my only consideration. Otherwise, I am not particularly interested. Is there a wish to defer the matter? We would take a motion. I mean, I, I get, can, uh, I'm just curious when this would get deferred and, you know, I mean, this would, this is just not something I'm interested in discussing right now. So, um, I, I, you know, if it's deferred, if it's deferred until the new trustees come on board, that's great. But if it's, if we just keep on kicking this can down the road, I guess I don't see a big problem with that. Um, yeah, I don't. I guess I have no, no opinion here. Tr Trustee Warren, it sounds like you you've got you've got something. President McKay, you, sorry, I don't want to jump in if you want to wait to be recognized. No, nope. <laughs> I am recognizing it. Well, I guess I don't have a huge problem with deferring it, um, but I personally can't see myself supporting it, especially in the pandemic environment. Um, so you know, I, I can make a decision right now, but I can also see uh, the will if the if, if it's if it's the board's will to wait until there's a full board or a new board. But again, like I I, I personally um, can't see can't see doing anything with this right now, and I would prefer to just let it go. But um, I wouldn't stand in the way of a deferral. Trustee Stofrand is being interested in the in exploring the policy 
Would you like to defer the matter? Oh, I could support deferral, but I think I'm missing something. What would be the problem with discussing it because of the pandemic that Trustee Warren mentioned? I'm sure I can. I can answer that. I mean, maybe this is why I would just I would lean towards just just dis dismissing it tonight. I think we, we're, we're very tight on our budget. Um, we've been, we've watched every kind of increase, you know, including the the increases to um, to village staff very very closely, which we should be doing. Um, I just don't I don't view this as something that we should prioritize as as something to do. And I I mean, it's just it's my personal opinion. Um, I do see the pay schedule, and I do see Shorewood Shorewood kind of near the bottom. But I also see Bay below us, uh, which is the direct comp for me. So um, just that the pandemic kind of overhangs everything and the tight budgets. Um, and that's part of my rationale for not wanting to pursue this. I guess some things that occur to me, I know former trustee Mike Maher at one point said, you know, if you just had enough to cover the printer cartridges. Um, something that occurs to me though is um, having paid babysitters in Shorewood, if someone wanted to serve on the village board, um, the pay at this point, you couldn't cover your babysitter. So that that's something that weighs on my mind is the um, how we limit ourselves a bit, perhaps by this. And I would I would support deferral. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would. Um, I'm not interested in. Um, this policy matter, but I would consider looking at something in terms of um, reimbursable expenses that might create, you know, might remove a financial barrier from somebody serving, which is a completely different matter. So it wouldn't be deferring, it would be something completely different. So at this time, I would either need a motion to defer, um, and if we do not have a motion to defer, then um, we can take a vote. Uh, well, you've seen the straw poll. So there are four in um, that are not interested in, in moving the policy forward. Um, there's one that is interested and one that is not sure. So the majority is Trustee Arndorfer. Not to get ahead, I would move to defer. Just Okay, so there's a move to defer. Is there a second? Yeah, I'll second that. Okay, so move to defer. And I would say that we wanna bring it back um, fairly soon so that it can be addressed within a policy, you know, that we're taking it in a time frame that makes it possible to be considered as part of the budget. Um, so there's a motion to defer, seconded by Trustee Arndorfer, seconded by Trustee Ersing. All those in favor of deferring, say aye. 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 And, okay, any opposed? Okay, motion carries 5-0 um, to defer. Thank you, Director Magnuson. Absolutely. Have a good evening. You too. Uh, moving on to 9C, consider resolution 2022-05, a resolution to remove certain streetscaping elements of the previously approved special privilege permit issued at 4075 and 4115 North Oakland Avenue. Um, this will be presented by Director Griepen Chad this evening. Uh, thank you, President McKegg. Um, so this item is coming before you as a future agenda item that was voted on last meeting um, with respect to the um, the planters at the northern entrance, the Metro Market parking garage. Um, as noted in the packet, those planters and other streetscaping equipment was approved as part of an amendment to the developer's agreement and the approved landscaping plan that required a special privilege be obtained um, for those um, uh, that infrastructure within the right of way. Um, since the approval and installation of um, all of that equipment, the northernmost planter particularly has been a, a quite a maintenance issue with respect to cars hitting it and enforcement staff having to write letters and follow up and getting it uh, maintained. It was significantly damaged um, later last year, at which point staff requested that the or that the um, property owner remove the um, the privilege. Um, however, staff does not have the ability to require that. And so they opted to um, just simply once again, repair it. Um, so they repaired it. Um, we were contacted um, once again by a resident asking why we keep repairing this, why we can't just remove it. 
Um, we did inform the resident of the, um, the special privilege requirements that say that staff can't um, have those things um, removed without village board approval. And so it came to you for discussion last uh, meeting with respect to consideration of the removal of the northernmost planter specifically, which would need to be done by a resolution. Um, I did also point out in the, in the memo that the um, transportation and parking analysis actually recommended that both planters in that location be um, reduced in height and depth. And so at this point, um, staff would be recommending that the village board consider removal of the northernmost planter at a minimum, um, as well as um, reduction in height and uh, uh, depth of the southern planter. That planter has not actually caused problems with respect to cars hitting, and I think based on the turning mo movements, but it was identified as a visibility issue. And so the resolution in your packet um, is drafted for removal of the northern and uh, reduction of the southern, um, but we are open to further discussion from the village board or direction as, as needed. Um, there's no huge time issue on this, so if additional information is needed, I'd be happy to, to, to give it to you, but we did bring it back um, in response to last uh, agenda items, uh, vote to, to consider it. Thank you. Um, so to recap, we can ask for more information and um, take it up again at a future meeting. Um, staff is recommending removal of the northern planter. The transportation study recommended a, you know, um, a reduction in size or in height of the southern. Um, so we could take action. We could include both of those in our action this evening. Um, or nothing at all. So with that, I will open it up to questions um, that pertain to this matter before us. Um, this really is just about the, the special privilege, which are the planters um, and nothing else about Metro Market, Kroger or the development in general. Let's see Arndorfer. Yeah, I'm supportive. Um, I guess just my own understanding, is there any risk if we initiate this action based on any costs that may be involved? I, I don't know if there are any, are there any costs that um, the retail, you know, the retailer might have to pick up or any risks along those lines? I think if I'm understanding the question, um, the um, the applicant would be required to remove it at their own cost and restore the area. And so that would all be on them as the agreement to um, install that in the right of way. So I don't believe there's any additional cost or risk to the village. Um, it was a part of the agreement to install it that they would that they would do so when, that they would remove it if so required to do so. So I don't think there's any additional risk or cost to the village um, if, if Attorney Bayer has different opinion. I'd be happy to hear it, but I think that's pretty straightforward within the agreement to install it. Oh, I would agree. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah, and that's consistent with our um, our ordinance. Yes, Trustee Stobrin. And so there would just be a, a straight sidewalk pavement piece. We wouldn't put in a new parameter for the size and shape of what we want. We just go for straight pavement. A sidewalk. That's how the resolution is drafted. Um, if if you wanted to install something else there, um, I would definitely want to review to make sure that we're not recreating the problem. Um, but yeah, if there was a desire to put, whether it be a bollard or um, you know something else in that location, um, we we could consider that. But yes, the resolution as drafted would be to restore it strictly as a sidewalk um, pavement condition. Okay, I guess my only, and I'm no expert on pedestrian safety, but I just wonder if you need some sort of a transition from um, the parking structure to the sidewalk that just makes, I don't know, I, it sounds like people are going pretty fast coming out of there, <laughs> you know, um, but no, I support this and can we put a deadline at like, can we have it done in 90 days or something? I think you could try to ask that. I don't know how enforceable um, we can make that happen, but I definitely, if you want to put it in there, I'm not, a, I'm not opposed to communicating that. And then with respect to your other question, I think if we were to have anything else within that place, I would want it to be something more temporary or movable. So we could always, we could always request or place a larger, um, you know, one of the, 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 the pots that are in the bid somewhere like that, 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 you know, could be removed or relocated. The, the, the permanence of this structure is what makes it difficult. Um, but yeah, I, I would be open to adding um, a, a deadline on this um, if practical. Well, 
What do you think is practical? 90, 120? I would probably perhaps give a date and maybe say July 1st. Um, I, I don't know what the construction season looks like right now. Um, as I indicated in the, um, the memo previously, um, we did ask them to do this and they indicated it was more work than you know, perhaps the ICs. And so they might need to um, you know, design or engineer something. Once again, I'm not sure with respect to pouring concrete in these kind of conditions, I would say um, July 1st would be a reasonable um, deadline in, in my opinion, um, but I'd leave it up to you as well. Yeah, I think given the weather, I think July 1st is more practical. And just to be clear, um, if uh, Trustee Stokebrand, are you, um, do you desire that we do replace it with something and that you want to make that part of the motion? Okay. No, I, I was going to say with that, I would. Director Bart okay. is correct. Something. Uh, mm -hmm something that could be movable if you if someone felt you know like the bid has the planters stored in the mm -hmm. boathouse yeah who would make a determination of that it's a safety requirement since their planters were design only they weren't required by um a transportation analysis is that correct yeah i don't believe any of that that infrastructure was um discussed with respect to transportation infrastructure, I think was more of a beautification or aesthetic kind of thing. And just post installation, we found that it was problematic, particularly the northernmost one. So um, I don't have the answer exactly specifically to who would do that, but my my guess would be the village engineer would be consulted with respect to sight lines and, and things of that nature. Or um, yeah, I, I think that I would defer to, to, to their opinion on that. Okay, thank you. All right, is there any, um, did anyone else want to be recognized at this time or would you like to make a motion? Okay. Sorry, Trustee, Trustee Warren. Warren. I, think, I, think you, I think you beat me by, by, by a second, so. Oh, well, I can make a motion if, uh, if there's no objection. Uh, yes, please. Let's see how, how we're this. I move to approve resolution 2022-04, resolution to remove certain streetscaping elements of the previous previously approved special per, special privilege permit issued at 4075 and 4115 North Oakland Avenue um, by July 1st, 2022. Is there a second? Second. Okay, motion by Trustee Warren, seconded by Trustee Ersink. Any further discussion? Hearing none, this will be a roll call vote. Trustee Stokebrand. Aye. Trustee Warren. Aye. Trustee Arndorfer. Aye. Trustee Ersink. Aye. President McCaig. Aye. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you. Um, item 9D, consider formation of a special committee uh, working group for the commercial zoning update pursuant 155-9B. Um, and you'll notice that it's uh, directly tied to item 9E, which is consider nominations for a special committee. Um, but we thought it would be important to form the special committee before um, considering nominations for that body. So I will hand it over to Director Griefentrog while I plug in my computer. Yep, thank you, President McKegg. So as the board is familiar, the plan commission has started work on a commercial zoning update um, that was approved by the board on December 6, 2021. Early discussions with the consultant um, who we've hired to lead the program to lead the project. Um, they had requested a working group um, to reference very um, uh, sporadically throughout the project, uh, making it very clear that public comment would be taken at, at larger meetings. Um, but this working group would be more um, tactical in their response to specific questions or, or thoughts that come up within the drafting of the code. Um, the formation of that was actually part of the packet on December 20th, which was approved. 
Um, we then did have a kickoff meeting for the project on January 12th, 2022, at which um, there was some public comment that was offered about expanding the group to include representation from Parks and Public Spaces and the um, Human Resources Commission, as well as an at-large member. And so based on that feedback, um, the, um, the, the, the size and scope of the group was enlarged to include those represent, representative members as indicated in the packet. Um, an update was provided to the Plan Commission within their January 25th, 2022 packet. But as President McKegg mentioned, we are here um, uh, with this item specifically to um, get feedback and approval on the formation of the group. And then the actual members representation would be taken up at, at the um, next item if so desired. So this item here is once again um, to um, kind of approve the working group with the project management plan attached to the memo. Um, and that would hopefully um, help us get started on the project. Great, thank you. Um, any questions regarding this item? Okay, is there a motion? Trustee Ersing. I can make a motion. So I move Great. to approve the formation of a special committee working group for the commercial zoning update pursuant to 155-9B uh, as presented. I'll second. All right, Trust, uh, motion by Trustee Ersing, seconded by Trustee Warren. Any discussion? Trustee Stoprian? Thank you. I was just wondering, so are we still thinking the working group will include 13 people? If I counted the number right? Correct, yes. Because mm -hmm. I think we had talked about, or the group had talked about eight, um, but then a quorum is only four. A, a, so a quorum for purposes of, of having the meeting and so I can tell you where that comes from specifically the advisory group for the transportation and parking analysis. There was a lot of um, excitement and um, desire to join that group. But once people found out that the questions weren't specific to them, they did not um, actually join the meetings. And so we had a hard time and we actually didn't weren't able to uh, convene the final two meetings, I believe, of that group. And so my hesitation with expanding the group from eight to 13 um, was with respect to being able to get um, enough people in the um, meeting to um, to convene. And so I would sure hope that more than four would join, but I, I did specifically put that in there because I don't want it to be delayed based on a, a lack of representation. And so I think four people is enough for the consultants to at least convene the meeting and, and get what feedback they can. And if um, if we can't get more people than that to attend, then obviously larger outreach would be required. Okay. And, and then there's, there's a possibility for people to submit comments via email and those can be made part of the minutes and the, the record as well. Trustee Sofran? Yeah, I don't wanna move ahead, but the um, the email that we got later, later, late yesterday or early today, how does that affect, excuse me, <coughs> how does that affect this number? Because it's my understanding that Arthur and I would be removed from the working group, but Melissa would be added. So would we be at, would the group be at 12? I don't think that email is uh, related to this working group. Oh, okay. Thank you. I, was gonna say, I, I have no reference of that email, so I think that might be something else. Okay, sorry. My yeah, it's something else. No problem. Okay. Well, I just want to say thank you for everybody for the collaboration to, to come to this arrangement and I'm excited for things to move forward. If there's no further discussion, um, do we, we do have a motion on the floor, right? A motion okay. in a second. Um, okay. With that, I would like, um, why don't we do a roll call vote? Trustee Warren. Sorry, right, just took a bite. Aye. <laughs> Trustee Orndorfer. Aye. Trust, Trustee Ersink. Aye. Trustee Stokebrand. Aye. President McCaig. Aye. Motion carries 5-0. Um, Wes, what's for dinner? You're making me hungry. <laughs> a, a beet salad. 
that I took way too long to oh. put I'm eating during the meeting, so. Oh, yeah, beasts are tricky. <laughs> okay, nine D, consider formation. No, 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 nine E, consider nominations to a special committee working group for the commercial zoning update pursuant to ordinance 155-9B. Uh, Director Creepenchalk. So thank you, President McKegg. So this follows up obviously in the last item that we just had. So with respect to the 13 um, spaces that were um, confirmed to form the group, um, I had reached out to the chairs or, 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 or presidents or, or respective um, uh, leaders of the plan commission, design review board, CDA, bid board, conservation committee, human relations commission, and the parks and public spaces to ask for nominations to fill those spaces. Um, the list that is within your memo is who um, was, was, was responded with. Um, so these people have volunteered themselves to the chairs. The chairs have forwarded them to me for your consideration tonight. In addition, there was one community at large member um, um, with, within which um, I, I believe President McKay can perhaps provide greater um, response on that who was selected, I believe from existing applications on file. Her, her application is included within the packet as well. Okay, are there questions? Trustee Sofran, your hand is up. Is that from last time? Yes, and I'm sorry, I'm gonna get a grip on this. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. All right, any questions or is there a motion at this time? Trustee Ersink? I can make a motion. Great. So I move to approve ordinance amending section 524-5 and 534-7, repealing sections five, two, I'm not on the right one here. I'm not yeah. on the, I apologize, <laughs> I went too far. Sorry about that, guys. I mean, we could take that one right now too, if you want, we'll just go backwards. Now. <laughs> I apologize about that. Um, let me get to it, sorry. Uh, here we go. Okay, rewind. I move to approve the nominations to a special committee working group for the commercial zoning update pursuant to 155-9B as presented. And just as a quick follow-up to that, if I'm on the actual working group, can I make that motion? Yeah, okay. Yes. There we go. Is there a second? I'll second, second. it. Okay, motion by Trustee Ersing, seconded by President McKay. Um, any discussion? All right, hearing none, um, let's do a roll call vote, please. Trustee Orndorfer. Aye. Trustee Ersing. Aye. Trustee Stokebrand. Aye. Trustee Warren. Aye. President McKay. Aye. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you. Moving on to 9F, consider ordinance 3041, an ordinance amending section 524-5 and repealing sections 524-9 through 524-10, contained within chapter 524, weights and measures of Village of Shorewood Municipal Code. Manager Ewald, this is yours. We continue, we continue review of some of our, our licenses and we're doing some cleanup work to make sure that the statute um, is reflected and consistent with the ordinance and the ordinance is something that we are procedurally accomplishing. So you'll notice some um, highlighted changes and then if you'd like, I can go through them individually, but they're rather, um, they're rather mundane. Um, but it, in essence, we're not in practice applying our ordinance the way that it's currently written. So we're trying to match that, that up together. Thank you, Trustee Earthink. I would love to make this motion. Thank <laughs> you, a rehearsal. This is the real thing. <laughs> I'm so thrilled that someone's excited to make this motion. <laughs> yes, I'm on this journey with you. Um, okay, so I move to approve ordinance amending section 524-5 and 534-7 and repealing sections 524-9 through 524-10 contained within chapter 524 weights and measurements, weights and measures of Village of Shore Municipal Code. Is there a second? I'll, I'll second. <laughs> All right, motion by Trustee Ersing, seconded by Trustee Warren. Any discussion? 
Trustee Stofran. Thank you. I'm having a hard time getting my head around what this is. So can you just like give me an example? Somebody has a store that sells salami and they have a scale in their store. So yes. like, how did it happen before and how will it happen now? Um, well, in practice, we should have been charging $25 per scale, for, per device. Um, per year. Correct. Um, whereas instead we were, were charging a breakdown cost from DAT cap plus $25 per establishment. So for, for places like Metro Market, their, their cost because they have so many scales um, is higher than um, perhaps uh, an establishment like a coffee shop who may have one. Um, gas stations are also another large user, and really the state has us incorporated within the state statutes to make sure that the consumer is receiving the amount of volume that um, that the the vendor is offering. You know, to make sure that that lines lines up and that no one's um, being unfairly provided with an incorrect amount of goods. So, for a vendor, let's say the gas station down the street. Does anything change? Um, well, one thing that will change is that the licensing period will occur on the calendar year. Um, right now, we've been doing it from July 1 to June 30, and state statute calls for that to be done from January 1 to December 31. That actually lines up better with how it's administratively handled because DATCAP provides us with a report um, and detailed breakdown of devices per establishment by November, which then allows us then directly to invoice those establishments within the village for the correct amounts. And did, is there something about uh, fees or fines or something that's changed? Yes, so right now. Let's say they're, they're, you know, their scale got out of whack and they've been charging too much. Mm -hmm. So the, the first individual who would notice that would be debt cap when they go on site to do those inspections and then they would require calibration. So from that perspective, um, we, we won't be in first in position to recognize those deficiencies, debt cap will be, and then they will require compliance. If for some reason it goes beyond that, um, the village has a mechanism within its ordinance that applies to um, many ordinances that we have. It's a, it's a catch-all that allows us then to proceed with enforcement. And we're changing it to that because right now the method to do so is overly complicated and one that would be administratively burdensome. So this should make it easier for the village hall at which level? Customer service, the clerk, plan? Clerk and customer service. Okay, thank you. And finance, all three. <laughs> Any further discussion? Hearing none, this will be a roll call vote. Trustee Ersink. Aye. Trustee Stokebrand. Aye. Trustee Warren. Aye. Trustee Orndorfer. Aye. President McCaig. Aye. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you. Thank you. Um, item 9G, discussion and possible consideration of ICC resolution opposing 2021 Senate Bill 807. Um, Manager Ewald was kind enough to pull together these materials for us. Um, so did you, your name was on the memo. Did you want to walk through it or would you like me to? Okay. Just pulling it up here on my screen. Okay. It's on page 153. Thank you. Thank you, Nathan. Um, and Nathan, if you want to chime in as well, um, this, this item came forward in December at the ICC um, following Kurt Witnitsky, Witness, pardon me, of uh, the League of Wisconsin Municipalities. They gave a presentation on um, pending state legislation. At that point, Mayor McBride had mentioned SB 807 um, that was being circulated and requested an oppor opportunity to discuss it more um, at the ICC with its other members. So in January, it came back um, and Mayor McBride from Wabatosa was joined by their city attorney, um, Mr. Kester, and they both reviewed 
um, the impacts of the legislation and how it impacts um, the city of Wauwatosa, but more importantly, how some of the language um, within the bill may open the door for similar instances to occur in other municipalities. And maybe Nathan, I'll, I'll turn it over to you for the, for the specifics and the, the may um, and how it may apply to other municipalities. Sure. So right now, the proposed state legislation is pretty specific. It, it's going to apply to property owned or leased um, uh, and next to the, the campus or part of the campus that is the Milwaukee Regional Medical Center. And there's really no secret where this came from. So um, the MRMC uh, bought a pretty significant tract of land from Milwaukee County. And there's doctor's offices, there's, there's a bunch of clinics and there's, there's land held for investment purposes, which means a specific thing under the tax law. And, and when these properties were otherwise, um, they, they would normally be subject to, to taxation under state law, except for the fact that when the property was otherwise owned by the county, most of that tax was not, didn't have to be paid anyway. I'm simplifying a little bit, but generally what happened here is, they were getting a pretty good deal because the county owned the land. And then what happened was um, the MRMC bought it and the tenants uh, had the pain of paying tax for a year and said, well, you know, this, this, this is pretty painful. We, we'd really like to go back to the way we had it when the county owned the property. And they, you know, lobbied state legislatures, which carved out this, this little niche for this very, very specific property and said, well, um, these, these properties are otherwise gonna be tax exempt and, and they're, they're taxed elsewhere in, in around the state. Um, so it has no direct, necessarily has no direct impact in Shorewood and in, in, in the sense that there's no property in Shorewood that is being taxed. It does have an indirect impact because it takes some of the taxable base out of the county. Um, but when you look at you know, the total valuation of every piece of property in the county, you know, maybe you've got a kiddie pool and you take out two buckets, you know, and, and dump it on the side. So it's, it, 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 it doesn't have as much direct impact directly in Shorewood, but what, it, what they're suggesting is that this might be a precursor to carving out the same exception elsewhere um, in Milwaukee County or theoretically statewide. Um, so there's there's that property and or there's that prospect and then the idea being that well um, you know it, what why should this particular little carved out area have have a tax exemption and, and not not anywhere else so it what what they've done and it has a pretty big impact theoretically in 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 Tosa because last year they they received that tax revenue and now if this gets passed they they won't. So um, it, this is more about going back to the way it was when the county owned the property uh, than, than anything else, but it does have potentially larger implications moving forward um, if, if it's expanded within the county or if it's expanded statewide. So the, you know, they're, they're asking for the other communities within the area to, to support them on this and, and pass a, essentially a, a resolution that's saying, hey, you know, we, we, we think this is a bad idea. It's, it's really not binding. It's not a, um, I mean, it doesn't really change any tax rules or, or it doesn't change anything in Shorewood, but it's essentially voicing support for uh, the other community in the Milwaukee County here, which is Tosa that's having a, a, a that's being directly impacted by this particular proposed state legislation that would carve, carve these exceptions out. Thank you. So yeah, I wanted to, to bring it because this is the first time since um, this board has been together that the ICC, a member of the ICC has asked for the support of the other members. Um, and so I wanted to come back and um, ask, you know, to explore it, whether we want to um, support it or not. Um, and as Attorney Bear pointed out, it's non-binding for us. Um, so it really is just a function of being the member of an inter-cooperation council, um, intergovernmental cooperation council, and that at times, um, you know, fellow municipalities may ask for our support in um, advocating for a certain position. So I guess I'd like to hear from the board. Um, so yeah, I didn't want to um, 
sign the resolution without talking to the board to be clear whether we were signing it as a municipality um, together or whether I should um, consider signing it on my own, which we are all uh, allowed to do. So, uh, Trustee Stokebrand, Trustee Warren. Thank you. I'm inclined to support this and I'll explain my reasoning. I do have a couple of questions first though. Um, Ascension on Oakland Avenue is exempt from property taxes in the village, I believe. I don't know if we have anybody on the call who, because Ascension is a nonprofit, I believe. Whereas if you have another, let's say my dentist in Shorewood or doctor is a small practice and they are for profit, so they do pay property taxes. I guess my point here is we've had a lot of consolidation in healthcare in the country, and a lot of it is being done by nonprofit entities. So, for example, one of the largest employers in the state, I believe, is Aurora Healthcare. Aurora Healthcare pays no corporate income tax to the state, as I understand it because it's a nonprofit and they pay no property taxes to a local entity because they're a nonprofit. And at the same time, we have the consolidation going on in healthcare. Um, so the options are being, the smaller ones are being squeezed out. And of course I go to Ascension, I'm an Ascension customer, but I think that the taxing structure here is highly problematic and um, especially in healthcare and it's time to um, it's time to make sure that there's fairness. And so I, I would support this, but if someone can convince me, if I'm missing something here, I look forward to hearing it. Thank you, Trustee Warren. Yeah, I'm, I'm also inclined to support it. I think that um, I understand that it doesn't have a direct impact on Charlotte, but I do, I do worry about the slippery slope here where you start exempting out taxpayers and all of a sudden um, you don't know where that stops. Um, so again, I understand it's just a resolution and this will be something that the state legislature ultimately decides, but I would concern, I would be concerned about, um, I'd be concerned about effects to our revenue stream um, and effects to our tax, tax base. If you start to make these exceptions and start to apply liberally, you know, who can, who can not pay taxes on a go forward basis. So I agree with Trustee Stoker, Brand. I'm, I'm, I'm inclined to support this. Thank you. Any other um, questions or comments or uh, would anyone like to make a motion? Trustee Warren? Um, I'll make the motion. Um, uh, I, sorry, it's just a motion is not, is not worded like a motion. Uh, I move to support, um, I move to support, uh, ICC resolution opposing 2021 Senate bill 807. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, let's take a roll call vote. Well, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Trustee Orndorfer. Aye. Trustee Ersink. Aye. Trustee Stokebrand. Aye. Trustee Warren. Aye. President McCaig. Aye. Motion carries 5-0. Wonderful. Thank you, everyone. I look forward to sharing this information with Mayor McBride, and I'm sure he will appreciate the, um, the spirit of cooperation. So that finishes new business. Um, moving on to item 10, reports to village officials. Um, 10A, village president. I wanted to give an update on the proposed development at 2418 um, 20, or 2418 20 and 28 East Capitol Drive, otherwise known as the Sunseekers um, project um, by Three Leaf. There are a couple of updates um, just so that everyone knows. Um, 
The company has changed, the developer has changed names, so you won't hear Catalyst Partners anymore. It's three leaf. Um, the plan commission reviewed the setback according to our code last week, um, and it was approved. It was presented to us um, with a very narrow jurisdiction. It was compliant, but it does, the code indicates that it goes before the plan commission because it's on a corner lot. There were some objections from the public and from some police um, plan commissioner members of approving the setback, um, but there was no evidence or finding that would support those objections, and, and so it was approved. Um, Trustee Stokeran did ask me to recuse myself um, because uh, Mr. Paul Hackbarth had donated to my campaign for village president in 2021, um, $250. Um, she was concerned that this created a conflict of interest, but I had, con I had conferred with Attorney Baird and was advised that it does not um, establish a conflict of interest, um, so I did not recuse myself. The Design Review Board reviewed the design on Thursday, and there was some confusion over their jurisdiction. Um, as a result, Manager Ewald prepared the memo that she will report on. Um, Three Leaf Partners did update their design, so there are currently no affordable units planned in the project. And so I, because of that and um, some confusion um, and some disconnects around what is the public process with a build by right um, project such as this that meets code, um, if the village board would like to understand the changes in the design more or understand the role that the village can play in incentivizing the inclusion in, of affordable units, we can put that on a future agenda um, as an item for discussion. And so that's why I included it in a, under future items of consideration this evening. Um, let's see. Item 10A2. Update on Dismantling Barriers to Diverse and Inclusive Committees team. Um, at our last meeting, um, there was discussion of work streams and um, objectives. Um, and the um, topic of reckless drive driving and um, came up and discussion around how that is a, a countywide discussion. And it coincided with um, the application deadline for transportation aid program um, app, uh, grant proposals. And so the director of transportation for the county put together um, a three-year proposal that would um, explore a countywide solution to reckless driving. And the, um, I believe they ended up getting 17 out of 19 municipalities to sign in support of the grant application, which is pretty unprecedented. So I just wanted to um, say that, you know, working together really does make a difference. And I'm really pleased at the momentum and the interest in collaborating um, because typically uh, across the county, there just has not been this type level of collaboration at the municipal level. Um, the Wauwatosa City Council um, approved an equity statement and we included the, um, the article around that. Um, I learned about tree equity, that there's a, a website that, um, manage, that gives scores for um, different areas, tree equity. So again, the inclusive communities team talking about how expansive equity is and the different ways that we can approach it. Um, and then Cities for Fines and Fees Justice, um, through my professional work in the Youth Justice Advocacy, uh, Youth Justice Reform Advocacy space, um, I became aware of a national training um, that is pay all expenses paid, putting together teams that can take on the elimination of fines and fees related to the criminal justice system um, at the county or city level. So I connected with um, the county and we put together a team. And so um, that is in Arizona um, in March. And then we hopefully will be accepted as a cohort for a uh, one year program. So I just wanted to let everyone know that I was participating in that um, on a professional level, but then also as part of a, this county partner team as fines and fees are an equity issue within the criminal justice system and definitely impacts county residents. Um, and there's no village funds being used to support this work. 
Um, and then item three, their, um, the Wisconsin Policy Forum has scheduled their information meeting for the North Shore Police Consolidation Study um, Project. It is next week. Um, it is not an open meeting um, per se, but I'm happy to take questions um, from our group and forward them um, to get the information that you might be seeking. And that concludes my report. Um, any reports of village trustees? Oh, trustee Stokebrand. Thank you. Um, first of all, I would just like to say that um, regarding the Sunseeker site, um, I did question the appearance of a conflict of interest. Um, and I noted that uh, it was not illegal, but it was also not in the best interest of the village um, because I did not, I could not prove intent. Um, I also appreciate, appreciate the open discussion of this, um, this issue of the transparency and the accountability that you've shown. And I think that this is what is in the best interest of the village. I would like to congratulate the people involved on the winter chill. It was a perfect day on Saturday. And um, I would like to say I did go to the public testing of the voting equipment today at Village Hall. Um, I left after about an hour and a half. It's complicated. And um, I'm just grateful for the efforts of so many to make it happen for the election. Thank you. Trustee mm -hmm. Ersink. Yeah, just one report. Uh, the Shoreward Chill was uh, an incredible event. We saw, you know, probably around seven, 700 people from the community come out throughout the day. Uh, we had a local musician, Trapper Shep, play, who's also a, a resident of Shorewood. I, I did not know that before. So we've got just some incredible talent here in the community and, um, you know, so many beautiful faces having fun uh, out in winter. And, um, you know, it just that, that warms my heart, you know, to see all the community come out and, and get together and have fun and so many great conversations. I think people are just happy to start seeing each other again. And uh, yeah, it was a fantastic day in Charwood. So uh, appreciate everybody that that was able to stop by. And um, you know, for those that weren't, there'll be another one next. Those that didn't, there'll be another one next year that will be uh, just as amazing. So um, thanks everybody for coming out. Any other reports from trustees? I did want to specifically thank um, Clerk Harrell for her work today. It's a new job. It's a it's an incredible amount of content. Mm -hmm. We're in good hands. All right, moving on to the report from the village manager. Good evening. Um, just wanted to update you that um, a discussion that we've been having at the Public Safety Committee meeting um, has been regarding the Police Department Early Intervention System. So wanted to let you know that that system that they're trialing has been um, installed and put into play at the Police Department. And so they're gonna be doing that for the next 30 days and then coming back to report back to the Public Safety Committee. So wanted to let you know of that um, recalibration there. Also wanted to update you that um, we've just received a number of inquiries regarding the RFP for environmental scan and strategic planning, which has been really exciting because um, many times we don't get um, a flurry of activity and conversation going, but there's been a number of firms who have reached out to do um, some meetings and some clarifications with regards to the RFP. I've already received two submissions. Um, the deadline for that is coming up on February 16th. Um, as you'll know, note many of the all the trustees received an email from me today um, relative to the fact that we had four trustees step forward um, and volunteer their time to serve on the review group. Um, and then in further reflection of President McCaig's comments and trying to um, divide and divide and conquer with the many projects that you had um, was suggesting that trustee Moore Baldoff step forward um, in her capacity as, on the strategic and leading the strategic initiatives committee. Um, so I didn't know if there were any other questions or comments with regards to that. If not, I'll proceed in that direction. 
The other individual accompanying us in the review um, will be a member of the HRC, um, Mackenzie Edmonds. Moving on, wanted to update you uh, that we've scheduled one of our last um, CDA educational series um, presentations on relating to affordable housing, um, related to systems. We have three really incredible presenters that I am ex excited to have all of you here and, and learn about how systems play a role and how their systems also impact affordable housing. Um, we'll have Frank Cumberbatch representing the Opportunity Center, Sam Coleman representing um, the Sherwood School District, and Kevin Newell representing um, Royal Capital Development. So um, that is scheduled for February 24th um, at 6 p.m. And there'll be more information coming shortly about, the, about that so you can note your calendar. Um, as President McCaig mentioned, uh, I was informed of some of the questions regarding jurisdiction um, with regards to the Planning Commission as well as for the Design Review Board. And one of the things we've really been trying to do this year through the manager's memo is provide education along the way as we work through some of our development processes because there are many different nuances and how our ordinances and the state statutes are set up. So Attorney Bayer was requested to provide that educational outline of jurisdiction for both. Um, so that's been included within the packet this evening and we'll also be sharing that um, more widely coming up this week. Last, um, on Friday, we had the closing date for applications for police chief as well as um, with assistant village manager. Um, we're gonna be starting first with police chief. We have um, our first round of interviews scheduled um, for mid-February, followed by um, a, a police chief, chief candidate meet and greet um, that's been scheduled for Monday, February 28th for final candidates. And then on March 1st, um, the police commission will meet, adjourn into closed session to interview those final candidates and then deliberate upon a decision. So those dates and information will be forthcoming um, in the manager's memos, but I wanted to get those on your radar. Um, and don't worry, there'll be lots of friendly reminders because I can't believe we're already almost done, almost midway through February. <laughs> So once we pass the chill, we're really, we're rounding the corner and we're, and we're looking towards spring. So that's always my cue, my cue point is the Sherwood chill. And with that, that concludes my report. Thank you. Uh, moving on to items of future consideration, item 11. Um, 11A, I wanted to give the board an opportunity. Um, so we've talked a lot about tr transparency and accountability measures. Um, and making sure that those are included in all of our plans um, and uh, administration of initiatives. And so I just wanted to give the board an opportunity if we wanted to um, set aside some agenda time to just go over what a list of our um, transparency measures and accountability measures are currently. And if there are any that we wanna add that might be either um, you know, easy to do uh, within the capacity that we have, or if they needed to be considered as initiatives for 2023. Um, I don't uh, have a feeling either way, but just because it's come up, I just thought that I would put it out there. So I'll leave it. Um, I can make a motion, and if there's no second, then we won't put it on the agenda. Um, if there is a second, then we'll take a vote and see if there's interest, but it may not be a priority for everyone. So um, I'll make a motion to um, agendicize a discussion of transparency and accountability standards at a future um, village board meeting. I'll second that. Okay, any discussion? Trustee Stokebrand? Um. I just would, because we're just putting it for a future meeting, I just, I don't see us doing anything because of the serious staffing situation we have. Um, I'm wondering where this would fall in the context of everything. I think this is important too, but I think that we have a serious temporary staffing issue. And I have great concerns about taking anything on until July. Oh, okay. 
I'd be open to that. I mean, I think one of the most important problems we have right now is our main communication piece. You know, the assistant village mm -hmm. manager, one of the main roles is, is communication. And obviously that is critical to transparency and accountability. But when you get the key person not there, it just, you know, um, I think we are at the point, if we can get through the election and run the election well, um, that's, and get the hiring done and the continual training we've got in front of us, those are the top three goals for me. I think this is important too. Um, but again, to my mm -hmm. point from last week or the two weeks ago, um, but I didn't get a second on that. So done. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Trustee Ersink. Yeah, I just kind of, you know, piggyback a little bit off of uh, Trustee Stokebrand. And, you know, I just curious on where this falls in the spectrum of, of conversation topics. I know we've got a ton on our plate. Um, this is always an important issue, especially in our community here is something that we, we talk a lot uh, about. Um, and I think we've made incredible strides in the past, you know, several years since I've been on the board and following board meetings um, to be, uh, to have measures in place and to be a lot more open and transparent in our dealings. And I think the community is going in the right direction. Um, like I said, this would be a great conversation, but I think we have a giant list of things that would probably supersede this potential topic. And um, I just, it's just gonna be added to a, you know, to a grouping of, of, other, of other projects that, um, that are, are for future mm -hmm. conversations. So um, I'm in favor of the conversation, but I think as far as putting it on this, this master list, uh, you know, I don't know where it, where it really fits. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I could withdraw my motion for sure. Trustee Arndorfer. Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, raising my hand because my uh, view is kind of wonky on my screen. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, I, I could go either way. I would defer to Rebecca if she thinks that there's some groundwork that could be done. I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't need an accelerated timeline, but I mean, if, if she's comfortable with us proceeding on this, with the understanding that you know it doesn't need to happen, you know, two months from now, but she can just do some groundwork in terms of maybe getting, you know, getting some you know some of the basic work done, getting some understanding of what the best practices are broadly, and you know maybe start to inform the conversation. I would be open to that, and if if she thinks uh, that she and her staff have the capacity, I would defer to her. Well, I would say, um, based on the conversation, I would like to withdraw my motion and, you know, keep it in mind, and then let's see where we are in July. Um, would you agree to to withdraw the motion? Your second, Trustee Warren? Yeah, I'm I'm okay with that. All right, thank you. I appreciate all the conversation and feedback. Trustee Stokebrand, did you want to add something? Uh, I was just going to say that one of the uh, key points I thought going forward was um, working on digitization of village records. And if we could see something happening on that as soon after like July 1, that would be, I believe that was one of the areas that Rebecca had meant, Manager Ewald had mentioned we could go forward on. And, and to me, you know, I'm willing to wait until July 1 on that. But um, digitization of village records has got to be you know, it should be at the top of the list in July. Thank you. All right, 11B, um, I put this, as I mentioned in my update around the proposed development, um, wanted to give the board an opportunity to discuss the public process opportunities related to proposed development um, 2418, um, 20 and 28 East Capitol Drive. So, because it is a build by right project, there is no requirement for um, a public presentation. But certainly the developers can um, offer a public pre presentation and community forum, but they're not required to do so. If the board would like to understand more of the redesign process and where the project is going um, and to see if it, um, and to understand um, what public assistance would look like in terms of incentivizing affordable housing units. Um, I just wanted to give the board um, an opportunity to put that on the agenda because there's not any other opportunity to discuss that. And it's not something that we 
um, there has been much discussion with in the community, so I think there's a lot of confusion. Um, that said, there, this is not a burning issue either. It's simply just coming out of um, uh, confusion that I've been hearing in the community and, and if the board wanted to host that type of discussion. So I'll make a motion. If, it, if there's no second, then it won't go further. If there is a second, then we'll take a vote as to whether it would um, be placed on a future agenda in, in the near future. Um, I move to um, agenda size a discussion of public process opportunities related to proposed development at 2418, 20, and 28 East Capitol Drive. I'll second. Okay. Um, motion by President McCake, trustee seconded by Trustee Stokebrand. Any discussion? Okay, all those in favor, show of hands or voice. Say aye. Okay, any opposed? Let's see your thing. Andre Burr. Okay, I think we have three in favor and two opposed to putting it on the, a future agenda. Can we just recap who was opposed? Sorry, I was typing and I had to switch screens. <laughs> yeah. Trustee okay. Ersing, Trustee Orndorfer. Okay. Thank you. All right. Any other future items for consideration? All right. Hearing and seeing none. Um, we only have one item left, 12, which is adjournment. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All right, motion by Trustee Warren to adjourn, seconded by Trustee Ersink. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right, looks like we are adjourned at 9.06. Thanks a lot, everyone. Aye. Good night. Good night.